Welcome to the Thunderbolts.info podcast for November 5th, 2012. We bring you all the latest news, information, and analysis from the Electric Universe, shedding new light on the mysteries that dark theories have yet to illuminate. At some point in the future, whether it's 20 years from now or 50 years from now, when the academic textbooks are finally rewritten to include a new and better understanding of electricity's role in the universe, the name of our guest today will surely be among those who will be credited with having inspired an unparalleled scientific revolution in the 21st century. His book, The Electric Sky, provides a coherent thesis for an electrically powered sun, a notion that, frankly, has simply not been on the table for discussion for the better part of the last century. With the passage of every year, and with new data continuously coming in from NASA and new observations of solar activity, it becomes increasingly apparent that the nuclear fusion, gravity-based model of the sun simply does not expect, predict, nor explain the phenomena that we actually see on the sun. But it's equally evident that these phenomena are expected and are predicted by the electrical model of the sun. And one of the primary individuals who deserves credit for this is Dr. Don Scott, a longtime friend and colleague of the Thunderbolts Project, and truly someone who will be remembered as one of the historic figures of the electric universe and plasma cosmology. Don Scott, welcome to our show today. Well, thank you for that wonderful introduction. My goodness, I don't recognize myself. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> well, these are exciting times that we're living in. We have, as I said, information constantly coming in from NASA, and it's information that I suppose could be presented by the science media as paradigm shattering, but it's generally not presented in that fashion. It was just a couple of weeks ago that we talked about the data from Voyager 1 and the inexplicable standstill of the solar wind at the heliopause. What are your thoughts about the current state now of solar physics and just how close are we to that, that kind of definitive breakthrough that everyone in the electric universe has been waiting for? Well, I think we're to uh, to borrow a phrase. There's going to be a uh, another meeting of the Thunderbolts uh, group coming up in January in Albuquerque, and I think the name, the subtitle of that meeting is the tipping point. And I think that's very very descriptive about about where we are right now. We've been sort of easing into this. Oh, oh ever since uh, Christian Berkland said that the uh, aurora borealis and the aurora australis were electrical back in oh, about 1908, 1910, somewhere in there. That's sort of the genesis of this whole idea. And then Irving Langmuir's work uh, and uh, Hannes Alfian in the, in the middle part of the uh, 1900s. And the whole electric sun model really is based on an analogy between what we see happening on the surface of the sun. We're not going to get into what's going on inside, whether that's not my point this afternoon to attack the fusion model or anything like that. But the what we see, the observations we make, many of the observations we make uh, of, uh, of uh, mechanisms that are occurring on or near the surface of the sun are clearly electrical in nature. And um, for example, the, the idea of uh, what an electric discharge in a rarefied gas looks like in the laboratory was originally done by a man named Geisler in Germany, and then the Crookes took it over, and then uh, lots of experiments were done uh, in, to measure the voltages inside what we now know is a plasma, that is to say ionized gas, uh, that we can see because of the way plasma acts. That once we looked at the structure that we saw in the laboratory uh, in, a, in an experiment like that, there was, uh, well, there were several, but one in particular individual whose name was Ralph Jurgens, who looked at those, those discharges and said, wow, I think that's what we're seeing when we look at the surface of the sun. And for example, if, uh, I don't know whether you can show that one of those slides that I, I sent you, but... Uh, the, um, in, the, in the laboratory, uh, we have a tube, and at one end we have an anode, and the other end we have a cathode. And if, we, if the thing is working correctly, and we get the right pressure and the right kind of gas, and the, 
things, the phase of the moon is right and everything works, uh, we often see what's called an anode glow or anode tufting right, right near, right above the, the anode. And then just out from that, sometimes separated by a, by a very tiny space, there's what's called the positive column. And Jurgens looked at that and he said, I bet that the, what we see uh, when we look at the sun, the, what we think is the surface of the sun, the photosphere, it's not really the, the surface. There's a lot of activity going on above that. But that photosphere is really just an anode glow. And the sun itself, the body of the sun, is really acting like an anode. And uh, then you say, well, what about the positive column? Well, that's the corona that we see. And uh, so if you, uh, if you think about it from that sort of analog point of view, there is a, a, a high degree of similarity between what we see in the laboratory in a plasma discharge and what we, what we see when we look at the surface of the sun. Uh -huh. Well, now, for people who are new to this subject, what would you say are some of the visible features of the sun that lend the greatest support to the electrical model? Well, as, as to the question of what features we see on the sun uh, lends support to this, um, this plasma discharge model that we see in the laboratory, there are, there are many. But I, I think some of the most obvious ones, at least are <laughs> the ones that I think support my, uh, my notion that the, the surface of the sun is acting uh, sort of like, uh, that is to say, analogous to a transistor, would be the sunspots. And everybody is familiar with sunspots. You, if your neighbor has a, a decent little backyard telescope and you have the right kind of filter, don't ever, ever, ever look at the sun through, don't look at it at all, and certainly don't look at it through a pair of binoculars or a telescope. You, good way to instant blindness. But if, there, if, you're, if your friend has a, a filter that enables him to look at the sun, then it's very simple to, uh, with a very, very inexpensive telescope, to look and see sunspots. And so the question is, what are those sunspots? Um, my contention is that they are areas where the anode glow uh, doesn't exist. In other words, there are holes in that anode glow discharge. And so on that little um, simple slide that I sent you there, that, that yellow area uh, has holes in it. So the, uh, the uh, sunspot is, a, is, essentially, uh, is essentially a hole in that anode glow uh, layer where we can see down through the anode glow, right down to the anode itself, down to the surface of the sun, which mm -hmm. we call the umbra, the dark umbra of the, uh, of the sunspot. Mm -hmm. Is it correct that what you call a tufting, that that's not present within a sunspot? Uh, well, the, the granules that we see, that, the, by the granules, you can almost see them in one of the, one of the pictures I, I sent to you. If you have a very, very good telescope, most backyard scopes don't qualify for that level of quality, but you can see that the, uh, the photosphere itself is made up of individual cells, little um, rotating cells that are separated by uh, little darker channels. And uh, so wherever those cells don't appear for whatever reason, and we have a pretty good idea of why they don't in certain places, uh, but that's still sort of subjective or conjectural at least, uh, then that's where you find a sunspot. And so you look down through that hole in the, in the anode tuft or the anode glow, and uh, you don't see any, any of those granule cells there. They've disappeared. Mm -hmm. Well, if you look at, um, at, in, at the results of some of these laboratories, I think the important thing that I'd like to point out to your, to your listeners is that we are able to measure the voltage uh, as a function of distance away from the anode. If you're traveling from the anode, in the picture that I sent toward the right, toward the cathode, uh, and by means of what's called a Langmuir probe. Irving Langmuir uh, got the Nobel Prize essentially for, well, one of the reasons he got it, not the only reason, but one of them was he invented this probe that enabled us to go into a, pro a plasma and actually determine the voltage at, at various points in that plasma discharge. And if you look at the plot of the voltage, you'll see that there is a certain voltage at the anode. Of course, you apply that in the laboratory. Uh, and then as you go away from the anode, the voltage actually increases. And you say, well, gee, why is that? Well, that's because of the, you're into the, those anode tufts, those cells. They, they are at a higher voltage, believe it or not, than the sun itself. And then finally, there's in the space between the, the glow and the positive column, 
that voltage drops off precipitously. And uh, as you can see there, it goes out toward the, uh, toward the uh, cathode at a much reduced level. And so essentially what that voltage plot does is it forms a barrier holding back any ions that would like to leave the anode, you know, plus charges like to leave anodes. And so uh, any of the hydrogen ions or the protons or whatever plus charges that are in the sun, if they want to get out of the sun, they right away come out and see this barrier in front of them. And unless they're quite energetic, and some of them are, um, they have difficulty getting over that barrier. So that's the function, we think at least, of those uh, those granules in the anode in the in the photosphere is they hold back the positive ions that would otherwise flood out. Uh, and in the little plot there that I sent to you, there's a there's a dotted line uh, that comes uh, and doesn't have that uh, uh, bump in it. It just decreases monotonically toward the toward the right, and that's the kind of voltage plot you would get if the anode glow wasn't there. If the uh, if, for example, if you came out. Uh, in a path that took you up through a sunspot, uh, you wouldn't you wouldn't cross a, a granule, and you wouldn't see that, uh, for want of better, a word a dam that holds back the. Uh, uh, I'm using a water analogy here, which is probably not appropriate, but it holds back those ions. Well, if if that if the dam isn't there, the ions flood out just like uh, if somebody blows a hole in the dam. It just uh, the water just flows out like crazy, and. Um, if you look at uh, the, the third picture that I think I sent to you, uh, there's a, uh, a photograph available uh, that has three parts to it taken in different lights, that is through different photographic filters, one of which enables us to see the photosphere. That's the normal thing we're used to seeing. Uh, and then the second one is we look at a higher level, uh, higher up from the, from the photosphere. We look at the chromosphere level. That's about, oh, it's at least a couple of thousand kilometers higher. But that's not that high because, the remember, the sun is 800,000 kilometers across. So that's uh, just a little bit above the photosphere. And then the lower corona is higher yet above the chromosphere. And if you look at the regions right above where the sunspots are, you can see that clearly something is coming out of those sunspots. And what's happening in the lower corona is that the ions which are no longer held back to the extent that they are in the, on the normal face of the sun. They collide with uh, whatever is out there in the lower part of the corona, and uh, they become very, very turbulent, very, very active, very, very hot. That's where the famous 2 million Kelvin degree temperature occurs in lower corona, and also those spots emit x-rays. So that shows that there's a tremendous collision of of uh, matter that's occurring above the sunspot because why? Well, in my light, in my view, because that's where somebody blew a hole in the dam. Right. Now, is it correct that the standard model of the sun actually has no explanation for why the chromosphere even exists? Um, I have never seen one. I, 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 I'm sure if you, um, astronomers are very good at a posteriori explanations of things. And so if you show them something, they, it's only about a microsecond later that they come up with, a, with a, an explanation of it that they say they always knew. <laughs> Even when new data comes back from uh, spacecraft that uh, they've never seen before, and you, 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 you're, I'm, I'm sure you yourself and many people have always seen uh, astronomers say they were surprised by this new data, very surprised. But they, but it, but it, it, it confirms everything we always believed. Right. Well, if they were so surprised, then why did, <laughs> why did, I, there's a big question there. And so I don't think uh, the standard model, quite frankly, even has an explanation for why the corona of the sun exists in the first place. Mm -hmm. if, if the if the sun is just a, uh, a very exotic wood stove. Now nobody says it's burning wood. They, they say it's burning hydrogen and turning it into helium by means of uh, the nuclear fusion reaction, uh, fine. But that's, uh, that's just a thermal reaction. The only, thing, the only product of, co of that combustion should be a stream of neutrinos, which, by the way, the, they still haven't come to grips, at least in my estimation, with why there are so few neutrinos out there. They've come up with an excuse. Um, I have a, 
a, a jaundiced view of that excuse. I think it's it's in the category of the dog ate my homework kind right. of excuse uh, that says, well, the, the neutrinos have changed their flavor. They've changed. They've been metamorphosed, or they've done have done something uh, to uh, change their their uh, character. So that's why we don't measure them in the uh, in the volumes that we should. But what about the plasma? What about the uh, the corona? What about the the spicules, so called, in the chromosphere? What is why is why is that out there? My wood stove doesn't have a corona. It doesn't have a chromosphere. Right. Now, also, you mentioned space surprises. Just last week on Space News, we t flashed back to 2005 when a CME exploded from the sun and it reached the Earth at one quarter the speed of light. And of course, the quote from NASA at the time was that this event had, quote, shaken the foundations of space weather theory. Um, I don't know if we've seen any evidence in the last seven years that the theory or the foundation of the theory has been, quote, shaken. If the foundation of a theory is shaken, that would imply that you're going to consider another theory. Well, one would think so, <laughs> if one thinks logically. Uh, that's the same sort of thing as what you alluded to earlier, the, uh, the cessation of the solar wind out there by the heliopause that was so much in the news uh, a week or so ago. Uh, yeah, the astronomers have, have made comments like that over and over again. This this shakes the uh, the theory to its very foundations. Then that's the last you hear of it, and then they just go on expounding that that theory over and over and over, as if that uh, shaking had never occurred. So uh, that's what we've been sort of fighting against all the all, all the time since since Birkeland. I mean. Uh, there are all sorts of um, examples of falsifying evidence and that astronomers say, oh my goodness, um, that shakes us, but that they never change their story. Uh -huh. Now, drawing this analogy to a transistor, we, we see in NASA press releases all the time, they draw analogies. They're essentially always mechanical analogies, but they are analogies to technologies that we can recognize here on Earth. This transistor an analogy, will this explain things like, say, the acceleration of the solar wind as it moves away from the sun and CMEs where uh, the charged particles travel at speeds that can't be explained through mechanical processes? Well, not exactly those two things, um, but it, it certainly can explain the variation in the, in the solar wind flow. Mainstream astronomy always seems to like to to do to use analogies, and I I, I don't uh, I don't condemn them for that. I think that's a fine idea because I think an analogy is a is a good way sometimes of of making certainly the public or even other scientists uh, aware of hey this kind of business over here works like that kind of business over there, and when you see that similarity that analogy, all of a sudden the light bulb goes on. And you say oh that's how it works. So. That's really not uh, to be laughed at or, or, or condemned in any way, but they, they, you're right, they never use an electrical analogy. And I think because, um, in my view, um, it isn't an electrical analogy, the process itself on the sun is electrical. So the analogy I drew was that the, um, and, and there's a fairly complicated looking little slide that I sent to you, and but I think it's, um, I think it, if, if you cut through the, uh, fun and games that are in that slide, now you can see that the that voltage, the first plot, uh, starts off at the surface of the sun at a sort of a middle level voltage, rises up and is constant across the photosphere, what I call the base, and then it has a, it's a, it takes a sort of an S-shaped curve. Uh, in the old days, people used to call that an ogive curve. It's a compound curve. Anytime you see that voltage in, that's an S-shaped uh, voltage, that says there's a, a double layer. I won't, uh, you can see it there in the second plot. My intention is not to get into that technical technical level here, this, to talking to you right now. But the point is that there are really two measures of any flow, whether it's the flow of the Mississippi River or the flow of the solar wind or the flow of anything. There's the volume of the flow, and there's the velocity of the flow. So we can have a very fast flow, but very, very uh, meager volume. Um, I think, for example, of uh, oh, Bridal Veil Falls in Yosemite National Park. That, that is a 
tremendously fast flowing stream up at the top and it comes pouring out but it's not very much certainly not when you compare it to the flow of the mississippi river which is kind of the reverse type of flow it has a horrific volume but it isn't flowing very fast at all because it's so large in cross-section so uh in the in the purple writing there you can see that the height of that photospheric um I'll, I'll use the word again, the, the dam, the, the barrier, uh, the height of it is compared to the voltage at the sun on the left, will determine how many ions are able to, to actually leave the sun. So that determines the, the volume of the flow, if you will. I called it there the strength of the ion flow, how many ions are released from the sun. And then the, the other drop, the drop there in, in through the chromosphere, if that is very high, that's kind of like the water coming off of a, off a water slide or off of a waterfall. If it's a very uh, high waterfall, um, a very uh, steep uh, water slide, the volume at the bottom is going to be very, very high. Whereas if it's a very uh, sort of a, not a very high waterfall, well, the velocity, it's the velocity that's determined by the height of that uh, chromospheric drop there. So that's exactly the way a PNP or an NPN uh, junction transistor works. The, the emitter on the left uh, emits carriers. They can be uh, electrons, they can be holes, whatever. Let's not get into that. But uh, uh, then they, those carriers uh, diffuse across the base. That is, they sort of ease their way across the photosphere. The ions do that. And then they drop down from the base into what's called the collector. And here's the interesting thing. The transistor works one of the ways, one of the major ways it works is to try to control that flow. And how is it controlled? It's controlled by the height of the base emitter junction voltage rise. That's the, that purple arrow on the, on the left that says plus ions going that way. If that barrier is made higher, that is to say if the voltage uh, in the photosphere is higher, if you raise that flat horizontal region up, higher, you're going to make that barrier steeper, you're going to make it higher and fewer ions are going to make it across. Well, that's what that's exactly what, what happens in a transistor. That's how you, you control the volume of, uh, of the sound coming out of your TV set or your, your stereo system. So um, I just saw that analogy, that, that, that shape of that voltage characteristic there on that first, first uh, voltage plot is almost exactly what you see in a uh, in a junction transistor, and I think it works the same sort of way. So you you if you uh, if you want to control the both the volume and the velocity of the uh, of the ions in the solar wind, uh, an easy way to do that would be that is if the the voltage difference between the sun itself, the over there that where that black curve intersects the vertical voltage axis. And the voltage of the photosphere, if that varies, if it becomes less of a barrier, you're going to get more ions. If it becomes a higher barrier, you're going to get fewer ions coming out of the, uh, the sun, which acts as the emitter in that transistor. So that's the way I think the things work up there. I think they, what we see is, a, is um, I'm, I'm, I'm tempted to use the word analogous to. I don't think it's analogous to. I think it is a transistor action that's uh -huh. Occurring there. Don, that's very good. And as I said, these are exciting times. And one of the things that makes the electric universe so appealing to such a wide variety of people in the general public who come from varying backgrounds and scientific backgrounds is the experimental nature of the endeavor. And of course, there are volumes and volumes of papers and books written on the conventional model of the sun, but we don't have anywhere near the kind of funding or support that they do. But coming up, um, it happens that we have talked about previously on Space News, the outline for a project called the Sapphire Project, which will attempt to replicate uh, some of the features of the sun in the laboratory. Why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about that. People are very excited about this prospect and excited about the findings that this could tell us about the actual nature of the sun. Oh, I am extremely excited, as you say. Um, and so the group of us that are involved with it are uh, 
we just can't wait to get this going through. And, and it's it, you're quite right. It's through the generosity of uh, some very wonderful folks who who have been, enabled us to even think about actually doing this in the laboratory, setting it up, setting up an experiment, and actually making measurements. Um, one of the most basic fundamental measurements uh, that uh, I would just love to see, almost as a as a starting point, is to uh, experimentally determine once again that curve that you see on that in that voltage versus distance plot uh, for how it rises up, becomes flat, then goes into an S shape, and goes down almost to zero uh, for the rest of the uh, out to the cathode. Uh, if we can see that that shape or anything generally like that. Uh, that's a, a wonderful first step to uh, to saying yes. This is certainly the way uh, a plasma discharge works, and then just look and see if we can see any anode tufting. See if we can see cells in that in that anode uh, glow region there. Um, yeah, the idea of being able to do an experiment here and get our hands on it, and uh, although we can't get our hands into it, we can certainly get a Langmuir probe into it, into the discharge, and make measurements of voltage and currents and temperatures. Uh, this is a thing we will never be able to do uh, on the surface of the sun. The, uh, the, the sun is so hot, I mean, two million Kelvin is, um, is many orders of magnitude hotter than the melting point of the strongest metal. I, th I think it's, uh, is it tungsten? I'm, I forgot. That will be liquefied instantly if you get close to uh, a temperature of two million Kelvin. So uh, that's a long-winded way of saying the astronomers just can't do experiments. Uh, I, I don't, uh, it's not their fault, it's just what they're working with. But we can, through the generosity of our uh, our sponsors, uh, we, I think in the next year or so, we'll be able to, to get our hands on some of this stuff and actually make real experimental determinations of these quantities. And that'll go a long way if we see similar similar things in the lab to what we see on the sun, that will you, you can never prove anything is correct, but it certainly is a hurdle that uh, the electric sun would then surmount. Indeed. Don, it's been lots of fun. The time has just flown by. Um, I encourage the listeners to check out your website. It's electriccosmos.org. That's electric-cosmos.org. And your book, The Electric Sky, I assume it's still available from Amazon.com? I, I think it's in the uh, second printing, yeah. Uh, on that, uh, on the introdu introduction page, that uh, Electric Cosmos, if you go down, oh, we keep going down, it's, it's a very long and there's a lot of pages in there, but if you go down to the bottom of that first page, there are a list of URLs, and a couple of those are papers that I have written on, one of them is on the uh, this transistor analogy, so if you want to get the details of it, you can look at the, uh, the, the PDF uh, paper there that's listed there. That's very good. All right, Don, it's been a blast, and I'm sure we'll have you back again in the near future. We've got so much more to talk about. And uh, as we said, we are at that tipping point. Uh, exciting things are about to unfold. I think you're absolutely right, Michael. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you.